Hi, everyone, and thank you for being with us. Um, my name is Sam Adams Lanham. I am the Community Engagement Librarian at the Barrington Area Library. And what that means is that I work for the benefit of and alongside our local nonprofits. Um, so if you are involved in a nonprofit in any way, I would encourage you to look for the nonpro nonprofit know how programs that are in our uh, newsletters that are sent out. Um, and join me next Tuesday. We're doing one of those on volunteer appreciation since this is National Volunteer Month. Um, and then I also get to work alongside fantastic local organizations like the Barrington Area Conservation Trust. So we have Kat with us, who is the administrative director of the Barrington Area Conservation Trust. So I'm going to turn things over to her to introduce our speaker and let her take it away. Okay. Thank you, Sam. And thank you to the Barrington Area Library for hosting tonight. We are so excited about the presentation tonight. Barrington Area Conservation Trust mission is to preserve precious open space in our community. We leverage conservation easements and land donations to restore natural habitats. And along the way, we want to inspire conservation stewards such as yourselves throughout the community. To date, we have preserved more than 500 acres, which includes five nature preserves that we actually own. We engage landowners of all kinds. We offer education, consultation, hands-on opportunities, such as our Earth Day, which is coming up on uh, April 22nd, Friday, at Peterson Preserve. We achieve our goals through the generous support of individuals, family foundations, business organizations that share our vision of a sustainable and beautiful environment. Every acre that we restore, every habitat that we protect, together, we're making that difference. One of our key partners in ecosystem restoration is David Eubanks. He's a distinguished environmentalist, ecologist, and native plant garden designer for over 30 years. He works one-on-one -on -one with his clients using native wildflowers, trees, shrubs, grasses that we're gonna learn about tonight and bring a landscape to life. Butterfly gardens, rain gardens, shoreline stabilization. He has partnered with private and public clients such as the Aquatic Initiative for the Chicago Botanic Garden, master plans for the Lincoln Park North Pond Sanctuary. He's designed natural stormwater management solutions for the South suburbs. He's leading volunteer efforts to restore a rare oak flatwoods. And I need to learn more about this, Dave, in the village of Green Oaks. And he's also helping Libertyville Township restore habitats up there. He served as the assistant commissioner in charge of wetland and natural area restoration for the city of Chicago Department of the Environment. That's a mouthful. And he was the first Greenway planner for the Forest Preserve District of Cook County. He's an invaluable partner for BACT. He coordinates the stewardship at our Far Field Nature Preserve. And just this past weekend, he executed a prescribed burn at the preserve with surgical precision, sir, keeping plants that weren't supposed to burn out of the fire. And that's gonna provide a critical renewal for the oak savanna that we've reestablished there. You can learn more about prescribed burns as a tool in restoring oak savannas and other prairies in our October 2021 newsletter in the library tab of our website. So I am pleased to introduce David Eubanks tonight, who will tell us about bringing nature home. Oh, thank you, Kat. What a nice introduction. And uh, I can't say enough about um, uh, the Barrington Area Conservation Trust. I encourage you to become a member to go and view their website at BAC trust.org ctrust.org and uh, that's an, an excellent way to get an introduction to their programs a lot of activities for youth uh, as an adult you can come out and volunteer at one of the preserves and uh, actually see um, a natural area being restored and help it along the way uh, tonight's program is called bringing nature home and apropos to the life at the Barrington Area Library that's bringing us this, uh, this uh, program tonight, uh, we basically stole the title from a fabulous book, Bringing Nature Home. And that has been written by an entomologist, and that's an insect guru. Um, and his name is Doug Ptolemy from the University of Delaware. And um, he has broadened my mind and many minds throughout the country with his book, Bringing Nature Home and several other books. Uh, related to the interconnectedness of our insect world to our bird world and to us and how they intersect and how important 
they are in terms of um, native plants being kind of the common denominator that helps us, helps helps along the whole life cycle. So we'll talk a little bit about that and then how to bring these plants um, to home. Uh, but as we get going in the in the slideshow I'm about to present, you'll see um, some talk about natural areas and what those are in our Illinois landscape so that you can get a night gain an idea and understanding of how um, how to integrate these plants uh, rather than just going to the Home Depot uh, on the weekend and buying plants that are from other continents that insects cannot eat um, and that causes a collapse of the food chain. So um, uh, we'll be going into that. So I'm going to uh, now try to start up my PowerPoint and uh, Sam, I assume you will let me know if, uh, uh, if, it's, if it's not uh, coming up, but um, I will see it in a second here and we're good to go. Um, yes, we, will we are still seeing, there you go. Perfect, thank you. Okay, okay very good, very good. So. Um, Bringing Nature Home is Doug Ptolemy's book. My program is really Ecological Design and Planting 101. This is going to be for an orientation to the homeowner as to why natives, why they're important, and why you should bring them into your yard and plant the natural way. So, um, and again, I want to thank the Barrington Area Conservation Trust uh, for doing this. This is the third year in a row. For those of you that have attended before, there'll be a few new slides. So, um, and a refresher course for you. And um, um, if there's um, a slide that comes up that looks good to you, I encourage you to take your, your phone out and snap a photo of it. That's a easy way and a quick way uh, to digest plant lists and things like that, because there will be a few plant lists along the way. And that, that, that may help. Also, it will be on YouTube later through the library's portal. Um, so Chicago wilderness is a concept. Can you believe that there is uh, wilderness in Chicago, it seems like an oxymoron, but it actually is not. There's a whole tribe of organizations, over 250 from forest preserves to park districts, to the cultural institutions like Field Museum, uh, to um, local uh, uh, organizations such as BACT, uh, Barrington Area Conservation Trust, and many, many, many other uh, groups that are all working to achieve an interconnected system of nature uh, that follow our river corridors, our stream corridors, major open spaces that were preserved over a century ago in terms of our forest preserve system. And um, there's a map here that shows uh, that whole, um, that whole uh, interconnected plan that um, uh, you can be a part of because once you restore your backyard, you become part of this chain and part of the migratory flyways, the insect pathways, mammals, um, all kinds of critters that can move back and forth and survive and live amongst our 7 million plus people. So that's uh, an important organization and uh, an important plan. There are three habitats. Uh, one is a native woodland and it's mostly predominated in Illinois historically by oaks and hickories, for example. And then there's prairies and then there are wetlands. Those are the three communities that are actually, think about it, translating part. Uh, for example, a woodland would be shade where you have shade in your yard from trees, whether they're native tree or not, not a native tree. Nevertheless, that's where you would employ native shade tolerant plants. Um, the prayer, just think about sun, where there's full sun, that's typically what a prairie uh, experiences. Uh, it's relatively treeless. It's mostly a grass and flower dominated land, some sedges, um, and um, essentially that's your sunny spot. And then your wet spots are your wetlands. So let's take the time. Native, native woodlands, there are some beautiful areas that are undisturbed planet that got, um, choked with the European buckthorn, Asian honeysuckle, and you remove, you remove those plants, uh, the invasive woody plants, and then all of a sudden, sunlight starts to filter down through the oaks or hickories, and up comes this miracle. 
And uh, uh, for example, we have uh, native flocks here, Solomon seal, wild leek, may apple, wild geranium, um, trillium. There's all manner of wonderful woodland plants that all we did was remove buckthorn along the Kankakee River here, and that whole ridge popped alive. And that's in the city of Kankakee, if you can believe that. So there are special spots like this all over the region, perhaps even in your backyard, if you were lucky enough to purchase a home or have a, a parcel that uh, simply was untouched by the bulldozer or the farmer over the, the last uh, couple centuries. So these spots do exist. And if you have one, count your blessings, you have an, a miracle right there waiting for uh, you to get that buckthorn out of the way. So um, this is Rollins Savannah in Lake County. Uh, there are many savannas, but the, you can see the giant burr oak uh, canopy on the, on the upper left hand side and how the filtered light comes through the leaf structure and kind of cascades light across the forest floor uh, or woodland floor. And that's, that's where you get all kinds of um, native grasses that can handle partly sunny conditions. Native wetlands, now these are your wet spots. They're vitally important. They've largely been protected by uh, the Clean Water Act and uh, that's been helpful, um, but uh, there have been some invasive plants there too that you have to get out of the way. Um, in green oaks, the rare flatwoods, um, it's called a Northern Flatwoods. And this, this is a place where Kat asked about earlier. And they're, they're, uh, the clay layer is very close to the surface and it pools and ponds up water temporarily in the spring, in the fall, when there's a heavy rain. And that favors um, such creatures that are rare like the blue spotted salamander. And uh, there's a chain of sedge meadow grasses and forbs that you find only in these, these special places. So um, I'm working with a group in, in Green Oaks, a group of volunteers that have taken it upon themselves and have worked for seven years to get the buckthorn out of the out of the woods and uh, bring, bring native, native plants back, uh, back into the mix. And there's another case where we basically just gave the ground cover a helping hand and the sunlight returned and then you get a magnificent thing. And the same thing with prairies. Prairies were a very, very uh, important part of North America. It stretched all the way from the Rocky, uh, Rocky Mountain foothills all the way up to Manitoba, Saskatchewan, down through Illinois, and all the way down to Mexico and Texas. So um, literally 1.4 million square miles were prairie. Now much of that is cropland or other municipalities uh, where we live, but lots and lots of soybeans and corn and other things. We are the, the feeder of the world and that great prairie soils have allowed that to happen. Um, so um, that's a 10,000 year old phenomenon, the prairies after the ice age, and it's been there with us and we're restoring at uh, BACT, we're restoring several prairies uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to its, uh, maybe not certainly to its original condition, but uh, to a much more biodiverse condition. So this is Sam Woods in, in Northbrook, Illinois. It's a Cook County Forest Preserve. And this is where volunteers started to make the discovery of removing buckthorn and seeing that there were these woodland plants that came alive and that were very specialized as well as the prairie plants. And um, there's a, a glorious view in the autumn when you see the Indian grass, kind of a reddish coppery color uh, or prairie dock in the lower left hand. It's like a giant elephant ear, it feels like sandpaper. Uh, bottle gentian is at, at the bottom. Obedient plant is that pink, pinkish uh, lavender plant. And then on the far right is the compass plant, uh, which orients its um, leaf to the north and the south to gain sunlight on both sides of the leaf. So you can find yourself in a prairie and it could be an overcast day. So uh, that's, that's an interesting plant. So these three ecosystems or communities, plant communities, woodland, wetland, and prairie intermixed together. Uh, for example, Rollins Savannah, I, I again bring that up because they have all three and they're all intermingled. 
So that's what we're going to borrow um, and talk about in bringing these plants into our yard. Just so you know, um, these are fire dependent ecosystems. They evolve with the force of fire. And that's very important to the prairie, for example, keeping it relatively open um, with the heat. And um, it's also uh, very helpful for woodlands and wetlands too. So uh, the force of fire is, is a very important um, component. So if you go away tonight, remember that Illinois was the home to woodlands, wetlands, and prairie. That really defined our, our ecosystem and we're bringing that back a piece at a time. Uh, Cook County, for example, 10% of the county, uh, 100 square miles, for example, is in protected uh, communities, ecological communities through the forest preserve system. So that's, that's, a, that's quite a landmark to have 10% of the entire county owned by uh, as, in perpetuity as, as open space, as protected preserves um, to be restored and restocked to its, its, its natural abilities. So this is an ecological plant disaster. This is along so many of our roadways. Teasel in the foreground, uh, drops its millions of seeds through the, the seed head there. European buckthorn is the first to leaf out in the spring and sucks all the sunlight away from the ground floor. And there's literally nothing growing, on, very, very little growing underneath uh, a buckthorn thicket. Um, you can see that these old majestic oak openings um, are getting choked out uh, by, by buckthorn and, um, uh, and, and honeysuckle. Now it's been cleared at Sama Woods. This is another view and you can see the dappled sunlight and the forest floor, the woodland floor is gonna make a recovery. So that's, uh, that's how restoration happens. Uh, these are not prairies. These are invasive weed fields. A lot of people think prairies, oh, that's a bunch of weeds. Well, they're probably thinking of one of these kind of, of looks. Um, Queen Anne's lace is not a prairie plant. Um, it is a weed from Europe. Uh, white or yellow sweet clover where the little girl is being swallowed alive uh, in the center of the slide is a, um, uh, a non-native plant. Uh, Phragmites australis is a common reed. It chokes wetlands. It's about 15 feet tall, looks like a lion's tail. And that's invading a lot of our wetlands, for example. And then on the, on the far left bottom is uh, thistle. And we all know what thistle is and uh, uh, these are not prairies. So um, why do native plants matter? Well, they matter because our insect world evolved over the millennium to eat and host and reproduce on these plants. Uh, they're vitally important to these plants to the extent that we eliminate them by planting just corn and soybeans, uh, eradicating all the prairie uh, or in our backyards, not having any prairie plants. What's happening is the insect world's crashing. If the insect world crashes, guess what? The birds crash because 96% of, of birds uh, are feeding caterpillars to their young. So it's vitally important that um, uh, the insect world just hasn't caught up evolutionarily to eat plants from other continents. So that's, that's the big Doug Ptolemy message uh, that's uh, so vital in bringing nature home uh, to learn about. And since 1970, Earth Day, when I was 10 year old, um, we've lost one in four birds, for example. And uh, one, one third of our species, all of our species in, in North America are um, at, at a heightened threat of extinction. So, 2.9 billion birds have gone since 1970. That's a, a staggering statistic. We need to turn that trend around and you can be part of that by bringing native plants to your backyard. And it helps with erosion, you're gonna see, helps with stormwater management and water quality, enhances property values and all the species benefits that come along with it. Why are native plants so helpful? Well, they aerate the soil the soil horizon goes right through the middle and the root systems are on the bottom half of that line. And you can see that um, they range down to 15 feet and they're very fibrous prairie plants. Um, so what you see above is oftentimes what you see below in terms of height and stature. 
very far left, you notice a little patch of green. With, that's a three inch turf grass horizon. So grass turns into concrete almost and, and water runs off very fast. It doesn't get, um, it doesn't feed the plants, doesn't get into the soil. It just basically gets saturated and offshoots all that water um, downstream, so to speak. So the native plants can really soak up a wet spot, for example, that you might have in your yard. So this is important. Why? Well, because there's a lot of erosion where water meets the land. Um, this is the Japanese gardens at, uh, at the Chicago Botanic Garden. And this got the, the Botanic Garden's attention when they started to lose this, this uh, rare collection of bonsai you know, pruning for their evergreens and, and pines. And um, they decided we need a solution. And the solution that experts came up with uh, that I had a hand in helping uh, facilitate uh, was that, that um, basically turf grass down to the water is a bad idea. Uh, it drowns, turf grass drowns, it gets, the topsoil gets washed away, sucked away, and then the clay gets, gets eaten alive. So there's a pipeway out there. That's where the shoreline used to be at the Botanic Garden. Um, you can see what the rise and fall of the Skokie Lagoon system does with each flood, grass dies, boom, cycle continues, topsoil gets, gets pulled down to the bottom of the drink and they started to lose literally acres of their collection. So they decided how to fix that. And one of the main fixes out there is the use of native plants. And you can see the orange butterfly weed that's a milkweed species uh, for, the, for the monarch butterfly. Um, there's all kinds of uh, wonderful, wonderful spider war and uh, different grasses and sedges. And this is saving this scenario, you know, into something of beauty and long lasting, um, long lasting erosion control. This is a pickerel weed, which is a wetland plant uh, that's very vigorous. There's bulrushes. There's cardinal flower, all manner of, of, um, of uh, sedges that are wetland loving plants. And uh, the Botanic Garden is a much, much better place. You can do this in your subdivision. You can do this at a pond on your property. Uh, if you've got turf grass down to the water, you can change your, your parameter. And this was one of my very first projects after the Botanic Garden was to fix a subdivision retention pond system which was one-to-one -one slope. Again, erosion going right down into the drink. And these are uh, very nice homes looking at an eyesore. Um, and the water's, water quality was terrible, murky, muddy. So uh, we brought in a coconut log that was gonna serve as a nurse log. We put in new topsoil seed, a erosion blanket over that. We cut plugs into the side slopes. Then brought the water back up. And after a few months, we started to get that, that, uh, that Tootsie roll, uh, that coconut roll started to become impregnated with all kinds of, of sedges and wetland loving plants. And um, this is uh, a Sagittaria latifolia, which is arrowhead and it has a beautiful white flower, purple cone flowers. And uh, the yards are still there. You, people are still using their cultivars. It's not to, uh, to take over the entire world, your entire world and say, you got to get rid of all your, 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 your plants that are maybe heirlooms. That's, that's not at all the message. The message is to integrate native plants where you can and, and use them and coexist. So um, basically you go from these goose poop basins, you know, to a much more vegetated slope down to the water. So that's the idea. And uh, you can use ornamental plugs uh, that are more expensive, but if you have a smaller area, they're, they're worthwhile. Um, you can seed larger areas, broadcast seed, usually done in the fall, late fall around November uh, or early spring. And then there's maintenance. It is not maintenance free. A lot of people think you put a prairie, prairie in and you walk away. Well, it's a labor of love. There are probably three to five times during that first, second, and third year where you have to cut the seed heads off of any thistle, for example, that might be growing up in there. Um, uh, Queen Anne's lace, you just basically weed whack the, the seed head, those seed heads off. 
and do that three, three, four times a year. And then the prairie, the little prairie plants developing their roots start to take hold. And uh, like the three to five years, you really have quite an ecosystem in place. And this is an example of uh, doing that on the subdivision scale, the common areas. Uh, this is Rygate Woods and Green Oaks. And uh, they've been at this since uh, um, 2010. And uh, they're entering their 12th year of, of uh, stewarding uh, their common areas uh, with native plants. And it's quite, quite stunning compared to how it used to be. And they even allow burns there when the right smoke conditions, smoke goes up and um, that renews and keeps buckthorn out of there, burns the little buckthorns out, weeds, and it's a very effective man management tool. So that's um, uh, one example of a subdivision where this can be employed. And uh, a home in that same subdivision uh, hired me to do a buckthorn clearing in the back and to start reducing the lawn footprint. Um, so how do we do that? We came up with a parkway island that was going to become a butterfly garden and mark that. Came up with a prairie perimeter around the whole backyard. And, you know, again, bottom left, uh, got the buckthorn out of there. And uh, um, you, can prepare the, the, you can prepare the soil in a lot of ways. Um, I use a one-time application of herbicide and then I burn off the, the duff and then it's ready for seeding. Sometimes you can use a, a shallow rototill. Um, if you're totally opposed to using herbicides, you can cover it with cardboard for a number of weeks. It's a little more difficult, but you can do that. Um, I tend to not sod cut, but you can sod cut this uh, instead of using herbicide, but that usually takes a lot of dirt up with it. So you, you lose some of your, your topsoil horizon. But that, that's another alternative, um, particularly if you just have a small area, you could just dig up with a shovel uh, two, two, three inches down and just, uh, uh, you know, a spade shovel up your, your turf grass and that's going to be your new prairie garden. You can add a little soil if you want to it uh, that you've lost. Um, so planting day, you've got a thousand baby new plants. You can see the oaks at the top left hand side. They can, can come in 15 gallon containers. Um, and uh, they're about eight feet tall, nine feet tall. Uh, the plugs are come in flats of plants. And um, I, I tend to plant these days more with, with uh, pint and gallon size plants because um, into instant gratification. <laughs> but you can buy small plugs uh, commercially through retail nurseries that I'm gonna give a slide at the, towards the end uh, where you can buy, buy these materials yourself. Um, and um, um, it might be hard to find a larger stock, but you can certainly find small plugs that are about two and a half, three inches uh, by five inches deep. And those plants uh, with some TLC can do just fine. Um, I put in the woody plants first, your shrubs and trees, and um, the butterfly garden. We used just live plants and leaf mulch because we wanted a more sculpted designer look to the, to the parkway. And this was the first example in the whole community for a parkway butterfly garden. So we want somewhat acceptable um, in terms of these new wild looking plants that no one's ever seen like the compass plant. And um, we planted down the middle, the taller plants like a spine and then shorter plants out towards the, the grass and then planted a lot of uh, similar plants like prairie drop seed along the edge to give it kind of a uh, an intentional look. And these are some of the plants that we used. Um, um, nine bark is a, is a shrub that we planted there. New Jersey tea is another small shrub, prairie drop seed, June grass, little blue stem, purple love grass, compass plant, golden Alexander, wild bergamot, brown eyed, black eyed Susans, uh, prairie blazing star, which is a spike of purple showy goldenrod, early sunflower, wild columbine. These are all pollinator, nectar loving hosts for butterflies. And uh, uh, that went uh, a few months down the road to looking like this. And that's a nine bark in bloom, common nine bark shrub, uh, which is kind of a showstopper. It looks like fireworks going off uh, when it's in bloom. It's quite a, a beautiful and golden Alexander. 
yellow plant you see uh, to the left there. So um, lots of native grasses. We put um, um, purple love grass at the bottom, left-hand side and June grass. They're very, they can take a lot of heat on the west exposure of your home. And uh, we, we, use, we used uh, plants that can, can really dry out um, along, along those areas. Um, um, we used uh, more water loving plants uh, near downspouts, for example. Um, there's a blue flag iris at the top left hand side uh, next to that um, downspout. And uh, it's, it's doing very happy just from the runoff of the roof, for example. So that um, project was the first, the first planting uh, that open lands uh, it was the Liberty Prairie Conservancy and then Conserve Lake County was their name and now they're part of open lands. Uh, but they were the first conservation at home uh, project um, certified in Lake County. And uh, um, it, was, it was quite, quite a, uh, a beginning uh, 10 years ago. And it's still there in good shape. And the same owner, Louise Wood, is still there as a steward and doing great stuff. So um, that's an example of bringing, bringing nature into your yard, bringing it home. Thinking of your yard as an ecological management site is what we're trying to convey. You know, your canopy, your shrub layer, your perennial layer, and uh, you have a top, your canopy trees, and you have an understory trees or intermediate trees, then a shrub layer, then herbaceous layer. And if you think of those four layers, um, um, or actually five layers, you, you, you get essentially a, a, a mecca for wildlife, an absolute mecca. You'll have nesting birds in various heights, different species of birds, all types of insects, um, mammals, um, it, it, it will be a, a wildlife sanctuary uh, along your perimeter of your yard, if, for example, if you, if, you, if you stack a landscape along those lines. And that's what we did. Uh, we, we used a whole variety of shrubs, whole variety of trees, uh, bur oak, blue beech, which is also called musclewood, hackberry, pagoda dogwood, shagbark hickory, swamp white oak. Those are, those are your a lot of your canopy and intermediate trees. Uh, uh, hazelnut is also called American filbert, black chokeberry, black haw viburnum, bladdernut, buttonbush, which is a wetland and handle um, a lot of water, witch hazel, elderberry, nannyberry, nine bark, as I showed you, shrubby St. John's wort, spice bush, swamp rose, and winterberry. These are all planted on one property, just to give you an idea. So um, you can do this at home. It, it's a possible. It's totally possible. Now the back perimeter, because there was so much real estate and plugs are not cheap, um, we seeded it and with native prairie and used thirty different species of, of, of plant material. And it takes a while. The black-eyed susans are going to come on first, and they're going to be quite vigorous and strong before the purple coneflower starts to come in and sunflowers, Canada rye. But eventually you start to see your native tall grasses if you plant a tall grass prairie. But there's two options. There's also a, a hip high option called a low profile prairie. And instead of Indian grass and big blue stem, you have little blue stem, for example, and prairie drop seed. So um, you, can, you don't have to have uh, a prairie where small children will get lost. <laughs> you, can, you, can find your, you can find your way in between uh, with, with that. But uh, this client wanted a tall grass prairie, a traditional prairie. And you can see the Indian grass uh, in, the, in the fall, how, how beautiful it can be. So um, that's an example. Five years down the road, you've got a butterfly garden and um, it, um, uh, it, is, it is, you know, accepted. Um, and more and more people throughout that community are going native in their backyard. This is New England aster, which is just stunning in, in October. And the monarch, you know, on its way down to uh, uh, Mexico is feeding the ground. It's an amazing plant. Um, there are shorter asters next to a house uh, called sky blue aster. 
um, because the New England is a pretty tall uh, aster, for example. These are shorter plants up front uh, near the front entrance, Virginia water leaf, golden Alexander. There are some ferns in there and uh, blue flag iris and a chokeberry. So here's four or five different species for one small area, um, but um, that makes an attractive entrance. And there's Louise, there's Louise Wood uh, accepting her conservation at home sign. And uh, BACT can give you more information about the conservation at home program. So feel free to contact uh, Kat um, at the office and she'll help you along there. Now you can do the little house on the prairie. Ready for this? Little house on the prairie. This is just your typical backyard in Grays Lake, Illinois. And uh, this is after a, a little prairie burn. And um, this is truly living prairie. Growing up in a prairie, having it in your backyard is, you know, as a kid, it's uh, an amazing thing to see how nature works up front. And um, it's, it's quite, a, uh, quite a magnificent display and it, it hides kind of an ugly fence um, and brings in wildlife. Uh, at Ryerson, um, uh, at the Brushwood Center at Ryerson Preserve, Lake County Forest Preserve uh, in Lincolnshire, there's a, a wonderful uh, uh, river woods. I mean, it's a full uh, uh, opportunity. To take the old tears, bring them in. And uh, the shrub that you see near the windowsill is shrubby St. John's wort, which is um, quite a nice plant for, um, uh, for staying low profile. And it brings in bees by the dozen. Most of them do not sting, do not care about you. They just want to pollinate, do their thing. And um, if you're going to swat at them, who knows, there might be a bumblebee in there that might, might sting you. But nine out of 10 times, these bees don't even sting. So, um, but the uh, scarlet tanager feeds on these bees. And, and so uh, the, the very first, the, the director of the, of the uh, Brushwood Center saw that her first scarlet tanager ever around the, the mansion, uh, literally a couple of weeks after this was planted. So just to give you an idea of how quick nature starts to function uh, when you put in these plants. Again, some showstopper type plants, butterfly weed, spider wart. Uh, where do, else do you find an orange plant? I mean, come on, you know, that's just a, a, a great plant. Um, you can find low profile plants coming up your front walk or along your sidewalk. Um, purple coneflower, black eyed Susan, Canada anemone, prairie drop seed. These are all species that uh, uh, are suitable for a long, uh, a tight space. Uh, I'm going to switch gears to a, a, a rain garden project. And again, um, I did herbicide the turf, it looks pretty dead, as you can see. And uh, we laid out uh, a, a trail, the rain gardens were going to be. And we started to plant those rain gardens, dig them out, and uh, planted all kinds of uh, cardinal flower and great blue lobelia, obedient plant, for example, and uh, uh, Monarda, mint. Um, so basically we're run, taking all the, the roof runoff and putting it in ponding pools. And, and uh, there's a selection of wet dry plants called rain garden plants that work well in those areas. Put in a trail system, leaf mulch to hide all the sins and um, little plugs and away you go. You also have to have a male model on staff, by the way. It's very important for the, the working with homeowners you know, that you have your staff that look fantastic here. So anyway, um, along comes uh, these plants and again, the same thing. And it's usually a marvel of what's going on. And usually people are pretty happy about uh, these kind of rain gardens. You can do hardscaping with ledge stone, uh, which is flagstone, limestone. Um, you can use any kind of um, any kind of brick that you might have uh, benches. Uh, this client wanted to have a medicine wheel uh, filled with pea gravel uh, next to her, her plants and uh, made a peace pole out of it. And uh, you, the sky's the limit as to 
what you want to do. You can take this to the institutional scale. Um, this was a church in Deerfield uh, called St. Gregory's Episcopal Church. It's at uh, Deerfield and uh, Wilmot uh, Roads. And uh, they wanted an ecumenical memorial garden where they, where they planted urns. And there was an Eagle Scout that was very interested in, 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 in following this plan. And it's one of the few churches around that is all native. All the plants in there are native plants and you can go in and walk the grounds. Uh, there's a burr oak that's gonna be there for hopefully seven, 800 years um, and get monstrous right in the middle. Um, there's a muscle wood or blue beech tree in there. Um, this purple spike is uh, Liatris or Blazing Star, Prairie Blazing Star. Again, your milkweed, your your um, your butterfly weed, purple flower, prairie drop seed. You know, a lot of these plants are very, very, I think, beautiful and ornamental. Uh, there's a bottle brush buckeye to the far left as a shrub that needs a little shade. Uh, but it's interesting. Uh, we put in an oval path uh, that allowed a lot of memorial services. It's a crushed granite uh, or dirty granite, they call it. And uh, that that houses a lot of ceremony uh, for uh, the urn process. Um, so again, the first year, you're going to get a lot of black-eyed Susans. But, but that's, there's nothing wrong with having just a sea of yellow uh, once in a while. And uh, um, these will calm down and the other find a way uh, in there. Uh, they're, they're a little, they're, they, they don't last uh, as long as the other plants, but they are, they are certainly prolific when they first come, come to bear. Um, this is uh, uh, native rose and we used uh, several native rose uh, plants. So if you're into roses, there are several roses that you can buy that are, are, are native to the prairie and wetland communities. And um, there is a very interesting leaf structure and a beautiful blue flower um, that's um, not in, the, in that frame. But then they forgot to tell us about a little flooding issue that they had there after it went in. So we're like, okay. In the same family, there happened to be Eagle Scout number two that we were working with to fix this problem. And uh, the flooding came halfway up the, you know, covered the, the path where they had these ceremonies. And we're like, well, what are we going to do with this wetland that's it's, uh, temporarily flooding out things? And so we came up with a plan to, to dig a swale and have this grass swale filter the water into a basin. And uh, Uncle Carl, one of, one, one of the relatives of the Eagle Scout, uh, came with his, his backhoe which saved a whole bunch of money for the church. And we started to dig and we took as much as we could um, and uh, advantage of that uh, we were gonna use this water. And um, uh, this is about a two foot drop in terms of the, the hole in the center there. Uh, lots of leaf mulch, lots of plants and they're all native plants. And we all went with the scout group. Uh, thank God for a power auger or gas power auger. If you have a big project, uh, you may want to invest in one of those. Um, it, it saves a lot of uh, the digging. Um, but these are pint-sized plants that took off. And you can see the blue flag iris in the depression area here and fox sedge, um, obedient plant. And um, um, that's um, a new rain garden for St. Gregory's and one proud Eagle Scout. So. Um, the water is going where it's supposed to go. It's no longer uh, flooding out the sidewalk and um, it temporarily ponds still, but it ponds where plants can use the water, which is the whole idea of a rain garden. And you may not have the space for a rain garden of this size. Um, and I showed you the slides earlier of a much smaller rain garden. So, you, but you can employ the same concept at home. And there's uh, another shot. This, one year down the road, by the way. Plants. So it gives you an idea of how fast those pints, that's why I use pints or gallons, because you really start to get, you get results pretty, pretty fast in doing that. Um, so this same paradigm got used at Fremont Township. It's one of the first highway departments to um, their highway commissioner, uh, Alicia Dodd, 
who is a master gardener and uh, has a, started a permaculture garden there and then uh, morphed into doing, uh, doing prairies and, and bringing in native plants around the planting beds that were pretty, pretty bleak around a government building um, in, in Fremont Township. So near Mundelein and um, bring in the same thing. Keep, keep bringing in those that native plants. Well, there's Alicia just figuring out how she's gonna conquer the world and uh, bring in a lot of native plants. And um, the, uh, the results spectacular. This is one slide of the grasses used. Uh, the first four are um, hip high to 18 inches high to 12 inches high and little blue stem, northern drop seed, purple love grass and June grass. Um, and then there's for shade, there's uh, common oak sedge, also known as pen sedge, Eric's Pennsylvanica or pen sedge. That's, that's kind of a, a beautiful, beautiful 12 inch kind of awning and a spreading sedge. Uh, some people have even replaced um, uh, woodland areas where they couldn't get their turf grass to grow. And they put in pen sedge, for example. And uh, a more clump grass uh, uh, sedge is the straight style wood sedge or the curly style wood sedge. One's a little more wet than the other. Um, so those are some of the sedges that were used and grasses. Um, this is the front entrance now. It's much more vibrant, full of uh, purple prairie clover and other plants. Got to watch the purple prairie clover. The rabbits do love to eat them. Um, so uh, you'll have to employ cat's dog or some other, uh, some other canine to keep those rabbits away. Here's another screenshot for you of uh, all the different plants that were used at Fremont. And these are kind of your boilerplate. These are your tried and true native plants that uh, uh, have their place. They all have different characteristics. Um, if you have questions um, on, on them, I, I will be taking questions. Birds, uh, but there's obviously a little too many to go through each one of the details of these plants. But but this, the, some are shade loving, some are sun loving, some are short, some are tall. So they all kind of fit together in their, in their right place um, with a design. Um, what to do with the shady part of your yard? Well, oftentimes I'll plant a ground cover of some sort, wild strawberry, wild ginger, uh, foam flower. And then I'll intersperse wild into that ground cover. And that could be woodland flocks that you saw in the very first slide I showed, uh, Jacob's ladder, wild petunia, wild columbine, for example. Uh, those are just a few of the wildflowers you could use. And then for jazz, you could plant some spring ephemerals that come up, flower, and go away. But they're so fun to see. And wild geranium, wild hyacinth, jack in the pulpit, large flowered or white trillium. Um, and then if you have a, a wet, damp, very shady area, I recommend ferns. Uh, you can't go wrong with maidenhair fern or marginal wood fern or ostrich fern. Um, and um, yeah, they're, they're quite, quite warm. So, um, and you can mix in your sedges along with uh, your ground covers. And that's what you can do in a shady part of your yard. So typical goal for Eubanks Environmental is to have um, uh, a home where you're doing the planting beds around the home and then you're doing a per perimeter, a perimeter planting, I call it, the trees and shrubs that basically accent the, the prairie seed or the woodland seed that you're, that you're, that you're planting. And you're basically creating uh, a, a habitat. And this, so this is a complete makeover in, in Northfield. And this is just one cor corner of the yard where we put in a swamp white oak Blue flag iris, uh, fox sedge, a button bush, meadow sweet, uh, another wetland shrub, and um, um, basically carried this theme all the way ar around the backyard. Here's uh, we're getting towards the end now, just so in case you're needing needing a, a, a pop out of the fridge. Um, there's a um, uh, uh, a project of mine in Wadsworth that I just picked up that's uh, over an acre. They had a, a, a remnant. Oak woodland that uh, uh, we took the took the the buckthorn out of, and uh, 
we're going to transform this site into again another sanctuary of over 50 different trees shrubs plants um, there's going to be a council ring for a fire ring for the family to sit on these oak um, these oak seats and uh, uh, a pool had killed a big area in the middle of the yard there we're going to plant one big giant uh, we it won't be giant when we put it in but eventually there'll be a, a giant bur oak uh, in the middle of the yard and um, even the drainage swale is getting uh, treated and uh, 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 converted over so this would be a high-end project this would be you know for an acre acre lot um, where you know basically you know spending twenty to thirty thousand dollars on a landscape is doable for a family. Um, so they do exist out there and there are people who want, to, want to go native and want to go whole hog. And uh, this is an example of that. So uh, I'm going to end with uh, a subdivision in Northfield uh, called Royal Ridge. And the developer originally thought that they were going to import the Rocky, the Rocky Mountain uh, stream concept, except it filled up with algae and weeds and it really wasn't working so well. So we came in with thousands and thousands of plugs and native seed and converted that whole paradigm, shifted it to native. And uh, that's today functioning uh, 10 years later very, very well. That's blue flag iris on the right hand side. So um, I encourage you to think grand, to think big or small in your yard and give it a try, even if it's planting an oak. Um, you know, you can you can do that. You can plant a native shrub. You can plant a coneflower, um, black-eyed Susan. Just try it and see see what comes up. Um, these are the nurseries that um, uh, are retail nurseries that you can get ideas from. Um, Prairie Moon Nursery in Minnesota and Prairie Nursery in Wisconsin offer very nice catalogs uh, that will educate you on plant palettes and uh, shade versus sun versus wet, hummingbird garden kit, for example, they'll sell you 32 plants that ships right to your door. They're small, it's gonna take a while, but if you're willing to wait and water, the, water, water these plants in, uh, you, you will be rewarded. So um, there's a screenshot for you if you wanna take, take note of any of these. Um, you can volunteer. Um, BACT is a great place to start, backtrust.org, but you can volunteer for your forest preserve or I, I lead a work day, uh, second Saturday of every month to, at Libertyville Township from nine to noon. If you wanna come out and cut buckthorn or collect seed or do something like that, as well as working at Farfield Preserve off of Lake Cook Road that uh, Barrington Area Conservation Trust um, uh, stewards and owns. So it turned, when Doug Ptolemy um, signed his book for me, he said, garden as if life depends on it. So that's the important message here because life does depend on pollinators, they our crops and without them, we're lost. So um, we, we need to take care of them where that baby oak can grow up and it can live 900 years and host 534 species of caterpillar, a virtual bird, or not to mention all the acorns that feed mammals as well. So um, I encourage you to, um, you know, to think big if you've got a space. Um, there's the website and phone number for uh, BACT, and there's my information, and uh, I'll be ready to um, take questions uh, that I believe will be facilitated by Sam of the Barrington Library. Here I am again. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you very much. So You're folks, welcome. if you do have questions, please feel free to throw those in chat and we will direct them to Dave. Um, so one, just real quickly, one thing um, while you were speaking, there was a moment where you froze and it happened oh, okay. when you were talking about the Brushwood Center. So I just grabbed okay. their website and I'm throwing that in the chat if folks are interested in learning more about that. Um, it's a fascinating place. And I think we discovered last year that we knew Catherine Game in common. Um, oh, yes, that's right. And she's actually, it's been a few years. It's been a few years since we've had any artists, but 
um, we had an exhibit of her artwork at the library a few years back. So yes, yes, they have some really cool art there, yeah. and uh, centered around the natural world, and it's it's really an amazing place. Yeah, it looks really interesting. I got distracted for a moment by a, a film they have coming up, but but I came back right away. Um, well, sorry, I froze. Sorry, it froze up. It yeah. happens. <laughs> technology just when you think you've got it all solved not so much um so one question that came up you mentioned um leaf mold mulch as being one that looks really it looks nice in the in the area um and it decomposes and feeds the soil well if if one doesn't have enough of their own is that something that you can buy or? you can buy leaf mulch through the mulch center for example, um, they sell it. Um, there, there are bags and bags of it at different uh, different locations. You'd have to call around, but uh, um, I would check check out the mulch center, okay. and uh, they they can even deliver it to you. But a lot of garden centers will carry oh. uh, will carry leaf mulch. It's okay. not as uncommon, but you won't find it at Home Depot or Lowe's. You won't find it there. You'll find pretty much the dyed wood stuff that I recommend staying away from just because it looks unnatural. Yeah. But um, anyway, anyway, but but shredded bark mulch is a good second okay. backup, um, you know. As long as we're avoiding the dyed. Okay. If, if you can't fold. Okay. Um, so the, for the impatient, Gardener, um, if you know we're putting in plugs, we're putting in some big things. But I know you always want to try and plant for how big the you know it's the the plant is going to be, not as right. size it is now. Exactly. Are there? Do you ever suggest annual fillers that could be used that won't disrupt the perennial? Sure, there are plenty of ground covers. Um, like that uh, slide I showed about the shade of your yard. So wild strawberry, for example, is a good placeholder that you can plant. Uh, wild ginger, if it's somewhat shady, um, will we'll do that. Um, so that's a way to, um, um, you know, because a lot of these plants go on 20 inch centers. You're planting the plant 20 inches apart. So there's real estate in between there that weeds can come up with and that's one reason for the leaf mulch is to try to keep the weeds down. But in between, you can plant some wild strawberry, for example. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. um, I planted and we had a planting project at my house last year. And I was remembering as you were talking about things, I'm like, oh yeah, my nine bark is going to bloom soon. That's going yeah. to be fun. So that's great. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of questions come in. So I think you were remarkably thorough okay. for our audience. Um, but I would encourage anyone, if you have questions, go ahead and throw those in chat for me. Um, I'm going to invite Kat to unmute as well if there's anything that, that came up that occurred to her um, that she'd like to share or, or questions or comment about. Um, I did want to ask, Dave, you had mentioned that the first two, three years, there's work involved. This isn't a, a set it and forget it kind of thing. So what are you looking right. for in those first two or three years? What, what can we expect we have to do? Oh, sure. Well, you, you, you will get dandelions. You will get thistle that will come in, for example, um, depending uh, on what was in the soil before you may find other little buckthorns that come up for example because buckthorn berries are in the soil if there was a buckthorn and you removed it um, so you'll you'll see little little woody plants that are coming up and I encourage you to pull those out um, that um, for example maples uh, they're prolific and they'll they'll spread all over your all over your your planting bed so you want to pull those little guys out and um, um, that's 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 about the, the main thing that you're you're going to see um, are are those kind of those kind of plants come in. So you it's might, really not fostering the new ones that you've put in. It's more keeping out the invaders that you got rid of to begin with. Right, right. Okay. And there's 
there's, for example, a lot of clover that will get mm. in the, the stuff that invades your, your lawn. Think of your lawn. If you didn't mow it, yeah, yeah. you would, you would see all kinds of things like black medic and um, which is another kind of weed that you'd see plantain. You'd see, mm. um, um, uh, I think the native Americans called it white man's foot <laughs> plantain because it came from England and spread, you know, from the boot, from the boot and the foot. And so um, okay. there's the stuff that you that you'd see in your yard is typically what you're going to see in your planting bed. OK, we did have one one question come in before we get to we've had one question so far, I should say, um, before we get to that, I will also say if you're me and 20 some years ago, you thought it would be really cute to plant some morning glory that would wind up your children's oh. swing set. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Okay. Yes. It's yeah. also called bindweed, and it binds everything and chokes out a garden very quickly. Yeah. So that's that's a very important plant to make sure you get out as much as you can of the root and dig dig that out. So besides just cutting the seed heads off, uh, there there are certain special plants that you want to dig literally dig out. But to the extent you don't want to, particularly if you seeded prairie, you don't want to be pulling up a bunch of prairie plants every time you're pulling up, you know, um, another a, a thistle, for example. So it's almost easier to, to weed whack off the head of the thistle and let it be than mm. to try to dig it out because you're digging up a lot of prairie plants along with it, typically, if you've seeded a prairie. That's different than if you've just plugged on 20 foot, 20 inch, <laughs> 20 inch centers. That, that's a different design. I'm talking about where you've literally put prairie seed down. Okay. It's, you're probably better off weed whacking a prairie than, um, and, and then you can dig up in between plugs in a perennial uh, bed, for example. All right, and that's a good segue because the question we got is about thistles. Um, and it's someone asking, there are native thistles. Is there a good way to tell the difference between native and invasive thistles? Yeah, get online and uh, basically study the tech. Te there's, there's, there's differences there that are subtle, very subtle, and native thistles are rare. You won't find them. They're, they're, they're not going to be in your yard. Nine out of, nine out of, you know, one out of a thousand times, it's going to be a non-native thistle in your yard. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't worry about that uh, at home. But in a nature, a nature preserve, you certainly want to be, be certain that you're not pulling a native thistle. Okay, all right, thank you. Yep. And when we look at grasses, we talked a little bit about the silver that I have discovered in the new house that I've moved into. There's the, the silver grass, I think it's called from China. Right, right. What's going on there? Clearly not something that I want. Well, it, it was supposedly a hybridized um, plant, I think, that was supposed to be um, uh, non-invasive, but it's turned out to actually be more invasive. Than they it looks thought. very prairie-like. Yeah, it looks very prairie-like, and you don't necessarily have to get rid of it. Okay. Um, you, you, can, you can live with it, um, and um, it, it's, it's, there, there are all kinds of native or non-native cultivar grasses, for example. And so, you know, that's, that's a choice. And, and I'm not gonna criticize anyone for planting a cultivar, you know, that's from the nursery industry. You know, if, if that's your deal, if you fall in love with a certain grass, have at it, you know, but um, if you can put in some native grasses along, along with that. Along with it, okay. Cause that kind of thing, it's not feeding my bugs the way I want them to. Right. Okay. Right. That's the difference. Okay. That's 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 the whole paradigm shift that has to happen. Is we our insects can't eat most of, not all of the, not all of the the non-native plants, but most of the non-native plants cannot support or host or feed um, f feed our insects. That's our butterflies and and bees and moths and everything else just just doesn't work okay 
Um, so one question, another question that came in was um, what is sometimes referred to as the hellscape, that strip of land between the sidewalk and the street. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've never heard a call that. We actually have a book at the library that's called Hell Strip Gardening. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I will refer to that as something that people mm -hmm. can look at. But also, do you have recommendations um, in Illinois that you would make? For the parkway, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, the polite name is... Parkway. Yes. The polite... Just so we're talking about that area between the sidewalk and the street. Well, uh, first, more and more municipalities and suburbs are getting hit using native trees. And a lot of times they will uh, subsidize, for example, grazing the cost, I think, of a, of a, um, a native tree. So, um, uh, not, not, not the time for a landscaper to put it in, but the actual cost. Uh, so, uh, you should check with your, your village to see, or your suburb municipality to see if there's a native tree that they can, that you can, that's on a list. Okay. Um, so if you planted an oak, for example, um, or a bald cypress or a blue beech or an American plum on your, on your, on your parkway, you'd be adding to the whole, the whole matrix. So that's one easy way to do it, you know, is to plant your parkway. Um, a lot of a lot of people are vegetating in Chicago, especially use the parkways all the time for gardens. And some are raised, some are not raised gardens. So um, I would I would just be more gorilla, like uh, like like Chicago, mm -hmm. and uh, take over your parkway and do what the heck you want out there until someone tells you no. Okay. Um, and uh, so, it, and someone may come along and tell you no, right. um, but, but uh, it's, it's, it's worth a shot. Well, I know in my, and that's Gorilla, G-E-U-R-I-L-L-A. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I know in my neighborhood, what I see people doing is they start with cutting out a little bed, like around the mailbox post and <laughs> just keep making it bigger. Exactly. So it's, yeah, it's not grass that I'm not cutting. It's a garden. It's the, it, it's a it's an accent the flower accents around a mailbox there you go perfect spot for some some black-eyed susans and purple comb flowers yeah and um purple. my neighbors has a gorgeous stand of purple love grass yeah mm. isn't that fun that's a fun yeah so <laughs> question that came in um we are starting to help with a bit of public land that is full of garlic mustard do you oh. have tips about dealing with garlic mustard on a pretty massive level and then there is, um, they accented, I mean, a big piece of land. <laughs> okay, a big piece of land. Um, that's, that is the case to be for judicious use of herbicide. Mm -hmm. Use spraying it before it goes to seed. Um, and um, other than that, you could get an army of scouts and pull it. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's that's the, other, the other technique. But, um, and you usually, it's a biennial plant. So you're gonna to have to spray it for at least two years, uh, maybe longer. Um, so that early spring and uh, you wanna do that. So you wanna hold off if, if it's just devoid of plants and it's just a monoculture of garlic mustard, you wanna kill that over a couple seasons before you plant it. Don't wanna put your seed down and then have all this uh, garlic mustard in there and then you pull that and then you've uprooted your seed that you've paid a lot of money for. So um, that, that's the process, um, but uh, that's a case for judici judicious use of herbicide. And is that a situation where a, a controlled burn could help or is garlic mustard not a good um, the problem, problem? Problem is it's not a good fuel. It, it doesn't burn. It, uh, it's, it, it just comes up green and anything green doesn't burn. You, you, you now, if you had a lot of leaf litter underneath it, like oak leaf, and you burn oak leaf. I think we froze. Dave froze. It again. would help. It would definitely help. phenomenal in terms of what they can achieve. But if you can't get it to burn, you know, you can't call in an apalm strike. You know, <laughs> there, there's no fuel. There's no fuel there, uh, which are oak, oak leaves or grasses. And typically you'll find 
you know, garlic mustard going crazy where buckthorn is. Okay. Um, so they go hand in hand, uh, typically. Okay. It's a degraded situation. Okay. So, and then a follow-up question is, um, do you have specific recommendations about what to spray with? Um, typically, you know, a glyphosate product is, you know, 5% solution uh of, of glyphosate um they make it so that it's aquatic friendly now there's an aquatic uh, brand of glyphosate which is the brand name roundup that we all know so glyphosate is the chemical but there's a lot of makers now of of glyphosate products mm -hmm. so uh five percent water solution i usually put in a dye uh of, of coloring so that i can see where i've sprayed uh -huh. and um and that that helps um, that helps you figure out where you've been and you're not overspraying. Right, right. Or missing spots that then infect. Or missing spots. Right. Exactly. All right. All right. Um, if we have no other questions, and we'll I'll keep an eye on chat still, but um, I wanted to just mention a couple of things. Um, and I appreciate um, Dave and Kat letting me speak to these two things. Two weeks from tonight, we're doing a program called Plastic Pollution is Everywhere um, with a scientist, a microplastic scientist from the University of Illinois. So I would encourage all of you to sign up for that as well. Um, I had a chance to look at the presenter's slide deck yesterday, and I am equal parts fascinated to learn more about it and horrified, but I do think it's important things for us to all know more about. Um, and then I will just put out a save the date um, and I know this is something that um, BAC Trust will be joining us for. We're going to have a garden expo at the library. Um, yeah. And it will be 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. You don't have to come for the whole time, although I will. So, you know, you could. Um, we um, confirmed today that we're going to have the, uh, the local miniature horses joining us. Oh, fun. Hour of that time. They'll be there from 11 to 12. We're going to have live music there. Um, the library's teaching garden opened last year. So that will obviously, that's kind of what we're centered around. Um, and we'll have a bunch of the master gardeners there. Dave, we would love to have you, although I would guess you're usually busy on Saturdays, so. Uh, well, if I can make it, I sure will. I prom promise I'll try. Yeah, Thank you. Wonderful. Sounds like a great event. Yeah, it should be a lot of, a lot of fun and a lot of a good chance to learn things. Um, a number of local environmental organizations and garden clubs are going to be there, um, as well as if you're looking for more opportunities to put these things into practice, the Barrington Area Volunteer Connection will be there. And many of our local organizations use Barrington Area Volunteer Connection to let you know when they're, you know, what the volunteer opportunities are out there environmentally. So, so um, if these are things that interest you, I'll ask you to keep an eye on our uh, June, July newsletter will be coming out end of May, beginning of June, and we'll have more information. But because it's so early in June, mm -hmm. we're trying to make sure everybody knows about it right now. So Saturday, June 4th, 10 to 4 at the library. 